of Top Deck Heroes. Uh, with you, as always, is me, Sean O'Brien, in Rochester, Kevin Broberg from Rochester, and Matt Hughes from Rochester. Best UFS ever. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about our the need for volunteers for JASCO games. Uh, we're going to get into our community mailbag. Uh, if we got time, we're going to talk a little bit about sideboards, and then at the end of the episode, announcements per normal. So let's get in, right into our first topic, and that is volunteers needed for Gen Con. Uh, they've put out a little call to action. There's a lot of demoing that needs to happen at Gen Con this year. Uh, we've got UFS, which we all know how to play. Uh, two new games, uh, Top Gun and Universal Tactics. And they need a shitload of people to volunteer and demo with them. Now, they've got some pretty good perks if you want to be a volunteer. You get a hotel stay in Indianapolis, which good luck finding a hotel now downtown. Uh, you get a free exhibitor badge, uh, breakfast and lunch every day. Uh, they're going to be at the JW Marriott for hotel space at night. And then you get free dinner at Buca de Beppo on Saturday. And then Gen Con swag on top of it. Uh, it's it's going to happen all the time that the vendor hall is open. So you got to be available Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday all day. You get two 15-minute breaks and a lunch like a union job. And you guys get to help promote UFS, which I think is great. Um, if, if you're thinking about volunteering, email Nathan. Pruitt, our friend over at Jasco Games. His address is Nathan at JascoGames.com. Any of you guys going to be volunteering? Nope. Can't. Got to win that cardboard this year. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a sweet gig if you're if you're not already predisposed, though. You're just going to play games for four consecutive days and you know, yeah. get a pile of promos and swag for it. Yeah, I'm going to be volunteering, but I'm going to be volunteering in the card hall. I will be returning as a judge this year with the sexy and sensual A.J. Murray. And we're going to hopefully run things pretty lean. I've learned a couple lessons from last year. We're going to make sure we have a break that's more than half an hour. And we're going to try to run things efficiently, get people in and out the tournament hall as quickly as possible so you can enjoy the rest of the con. So, please, if you want to go to Gen Con and you're unsure, and you're willing to volunteer, let Nathan know, because they need a whole bunch of volunteers this year. Uh, their booth is always fantastic because of the people who help them out. Jasco Games needs you guys. So, tonight is our community mailbag episode. Uh, we asked our viewers to send us questions regarding UFS and everything related to the show, and we're going to try to answer as many of them as we can. So we'll move right on to our first question from David Dobson. And do forgive me tonight because I'm terrible with names. If any of you guys have ever been to a UFS tournament. Uh, poor Heladoro, I've pronounced his name incorrectly every single time in a different way. So David Dobson asks, are all cards legal in UFS or, does, or is it like magic with different formats? Which is a great question. Yeah, it's really a lot like Magic. There's a rotating standard format in the same kind of way where every few, well, a little less standardized in our case because the release schedule hasn't been entirely worked out to a science in the way that Magic has, where they, you know, it's not quite consistent. But uh, cards as they age or cards are released remain legal and standard for a few years and then graduate to the larger formats where cards further back in the history of the game are legal. Uh, the new Extended format was recently reintroduced after it kind of fell by the wayside due to uh, a very large change in the game, and that would be dominated only by the old cards. Uh, and so in a lot of ways, it's very similar to the modern format in Magic, where it's kind of a new format, a little bit underexplored. Well, mo the way modern was a year or two ago, I guess. It's a little underexplored, and but still exciting and higher power than standard. And we also have a legacy format where cards dating back to the origins of the game in the first sets of Street Fighter, Soul Calibur, and Penny Arcade uh, are still legal, but not a lot of people play it. Yeah, unfortunately, Jasco Games uh, stopped supporting the legacy format back in 2014. Uh, there are plenty of avenues to get the card still, but not many people who play it. Um, if you want to play legacy, there are cards to have, and there are a ton of them, and it can be a lot of fun. Yeah, it's, it's a great kitchen table format. There's a lot of really cool and fun cards, 
um, it can be a little unpleasant at times in tournament conditions. Yes. Um, let's see. Our next question, we got uh, several questions from Fernan Fernando Aragon, and I, I definitely butchered that one. Uh, he first asks about our, our thoughts on the July 9th post, uh, July 8th posting rather, on Jasco Games' Facebook page regarding some big announcements tomorrow at Comic-Con. And I know Matt wanted to talk a bit about this because he's super excited. Yeah. I am so excited because they're making an announcement at Comic-Con, which is really huge because it means that it's something overall that's for gaming community in general, not just something for us. Like, if there was going to be, like, some random new thing for UFS uh, that was something that we specifically would care about, they would announce it at Gen Con. Which, they're doing an announcement at Gen Con, so we're probably going to get that as well. But, if they're announcing it at Comic-Con, and they're announcing it tomorrow, that probably means it's going to be during one of the opening panels they have. And there's a lot of interesting things. There's the April Fool's joke stays alive with G.I. Joe. Um, there's some less likely things, like Shonen Jump, Transformers, and then... Sonic the Hedgehog? Sonic... No, nah, maybe. There's, um... There's also interesting thing. It's really out there, but uh, Rare has a panel with all of their games. Donkey Kong Country. Years. Yeah, like that's a so lot Banjo of other things. You're, Subzy, so Banzo you're telling me Banjo Kazooie wasn't in Super Smash Brothers because he had to be in UFS? That's great news. <laughs> like those are the ones pretty out there, but right in the center of the day, in the largest hall at Comic Con. Is the Street Fighter V final panel. Uh, so I, I think we might be getting something some people have been waiting for for years to come back. I, yes. Even though I've pretty much guessed it, I'm really excited. Yeah, Street Fighter V I think would be very big for UFS. Uh, Street Fighter has been kind of missed in the last couple of years uh, when we switched to the Universal Namco system. Uh, when James Hada took over design back under Fantasy Flight. Um, hopefully Jasco doesn't try to make another tournament playable Chun-Li. We see, we saw how that happened last time. <laughs> well, I think our designers are a lot better than they were back in that, back in those days. Uh, we actually have a playtest team. We actually have, you know, uh, someone who's, who works full-time on the game. Well, several people who work full-time on the game, designing and developing the cards instead of being the hurried side project that it often was under Fantasy Flight. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy with Street Fighter. Uh, less happy than I would be with G.I. Joe. Um, G.I. Joe is something I remember when I was a kid. Kevin, you're too young for G.I. Joe, I think. If we're talking about childhood nostalgia, I got to give a shout out to Mortal Kombat. Like, do you know how many times I watched both of those movies? And the first one was actually kind of remotely good, but the second one did not deserve to be watched that many times? Oh, man. Well, I know my... Uh... Big Daddy Matt Turner says he should. We should get Mortal Kombat. Boys, yeah. get ready. Uh, my idea, one well, reason why I don't think it'll ever be Mortal Kombat. A little thing that not too many people know. Back when UFS first started, about ten years ago, there was some other card game that came out that was a similar premise. It was a card game emulating a fighting game. But and it had. Oh, was this that game? Yeah. It had, like I don't remember, yeah. Or something, you have to, no, 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 you have to no, no, get a dealer? No, it's not that okay, one. Never... It's not Decipher's crap. Um, I don't remember <laughs> what company made it. And I, unfortunately, the one pack of cards I bought of it is long gone. I think I gave it away to someone. But it had two major flaws. Uh, one, its combat system was awful. I don't remember how it worked. And two... It was sold exclusively at Blockbuster Video. <laughs> Do those things even exist anymore? Nope. Okay. Well, I mean, if, if trading card, if other card games that exist with the thing are going to disqualify it, I mean, Street Fighter had a deck building game that came out like three years ago. <laughs> That's a true story. Um, so you said Jump, Jump yeah. has a uh, a panel tomorrow as well. Yeah. I mean, that one's that really, really reaching it, because they would technically have to acquire multiple different licenses for it. Or they could, I guess they could acquire one at a time. Yeah. And, and if Shonen Jump wanted to strengthen their brand, they might be trying to compete with 
uh, the they they might see the success that a lot of people have with uh, the the uh, what are the, the the two other Japanese card games that have license? Why one, one of which has Wise. Yeah, King of Fighters. And King. And they might bundle those together and make that part of the. That could it'll be, be, inter- it'll be interesting to see. And I think um, you know one of the other things that uh, Fernando had asked about was uh, Red Horizon. And, I mean, hopefully we're going to be getting a new Red Horizon set soon. I think they spoiled that one's coming up. I don't recall. Yeah, I know I know that we have the reprint list of cards from the previous Red Horizon and other sets that will be in that set, that are the first spoilers for that set that's out there. So we're definitely getting another one here on the horizon. Okay, so let's move on to our next question. Uh, Fernando again asks us, uh, "What for each of us, what is our favorite character of all time to play? All the way back to the beginning, if we want to. Uh, let's go with Kevin first. So, I-, I thought about this one, and I actually didn't have to think about it for very long. It's 2.K- the one that just got banned in standard. Well, just last year, got banned in standard. And the reason, so I-, I think he's so much fun to play. He, Unlike a lot of characters, you don't, I mean, like you play a seven or eight hand size character and it's a different feeling than it is playing a six hand size character. And I feel like you just have a little bit more of just kind of like, I don't really know. But so I, I didn't have to think, I didn't think too hard about this because I just, when I just thought of in terms of, you know, what cards could I play them with? How much fun did I have playing them? I think that the Jasco games era of the game has had a just much more fun game design, card design, set design, everything than previously and there weren't a lot of oppressive horrible broken things that you had to deal with when you're playing them so like my one of my, my, my first character i really fell in love with was two dot sophidia but every all the time that i was playing her i was losing to absurd strength and i was losing to blood runs true and i was losing to young sung and it was so that, that holds that down so i just i said well what's my favorite character recently k dash by a mile <laughs> Well, I know for me, I mean, my favorite character from the beginning is probably uh, 2.0 Yoshitora, the five-hander that can commit his assets as they were foundations. Uh, But like Kevin, I fell into kind of an unpleasant place when I was playing him because I lost every week to Giggles playing Alex with absurd strength and chain throw and somehow always having three absurd strengths in his hand and no way to stop throws. It was great. Um, In the new era of UFS... um, my favorite character has been uh, Lu Chen. Um, good, old, good old dirty old man. Dirty old man. Uh, I mean, he had a lot of great cards to disrupt your opponent. Uh, Lu Chen is my one match win against uh, Garrett Brett playing his Astrid, which I beat Garrett Brett with B-tier garbage, so I was pretty happy with that. And, yeah, that's really about it for me. What do you think, Matt? Um, My favorite of the old characters... It's a really close tie between the old uh, promo Ukio, uh, who could just, you know, have a 13 card hand size when he's going to win. Just because I liked my evil deck so much with it, it was just the perfect amount of redundancy in the deck with eight actions for damage pump, eight float effects, chain throw, kunai, and then it is enhanced to strip your opponent's hand. It was just, it was literally, I built the deck, flip over the top uh, roughly 21 cards of my deck, and I kill my opponent. Um, and then starter deck Sakura. Ew. Um, no. What? I like playing any card from a discard pile of return. Especially my Addis Syndicate that I just had to use twice. I, I was an awful person, okay? You were. At least I'm not saying I liked playing Zasalamel or Cassandra. I mean, good times. I mean, that, then at least I can give you credit for you know enjoying something broken. Sakura is just like, blah. So moving on to our next question, uh, once again from Fernando, asking when we're going to have more of the uncommon common sets in stock in Rochester CCG. Uh, hopefully, pretty soon. Uh, we recently opened a bunch of boxes uh, from King of Fighters and Ruler of Time. Uh, Neomax, you will probably never see that product available again, unfortunately, because there are no more boxes of Neomax. They're all gone. Except for my secret stash that I can't get my seller to part with. 
Uh, once again, last question from Fernando. He wants us to give him a shout out to his new UFS community page, uh, www.superaragonbrothers.com. Uh, they're going to be putting some UFS content up, and I'd love to have as much content out there about our awesome game as possible. Uh, he also wants to know if we are willing to come on his show next week as guests. I could probably do that if you guys want to go. What day is it? Sure, why not? It, it, I'll have to find out because Wednesdays is out for all of us and Thursdays is out for you, Hughes. Yep. We got a very busy week. <laughs> okay, so next question, moving on to uh, Brett Blaze asks, uh, which characters from Warriors of the Night will see the most least play? Hughes, why don't you go first? Um, me? I'll start with the man I just put up right now. Um... I think Dimitri's going to be one of the big ones. Um, he's very reminiscent of Angels uh, with being able to flip something every turn. Um, he doesn't have the fuse thing with its really stupid absurdities, but just being able to flip and lock down uh, permanently, just get rid of permanently, their best foundation they play every turn is really good. And if you're done doing that, you can gain some life and just tank out. And it's an enhance I think will give a lot of good shenanigans. Possibly allow you to set up some good combo decks. Like two dark side masters into something. Yeah, I think it's it's really cool how you can kind of like pick the right tool for the job and kind of be adaptive that way. Mm -hmm. How about the least played character, Hughes? Least played for me? Ah. Uh, as much as I hyped Tel Bane, I don't think he's as good as I thought. So my pick actually, so I actually agreed with you on the most play. I think it's going to be Dimitri because people really like having control of the game and having, you know, be, being able to see the choices they make influence the outcome. And I think it's like the, the, the gimmick with the card pool is pretty cool. Like picking out, I mean, I think Dark Side Master and the Game Life Throw are both very strong, you know, offensively and defensively respectively. Uh, but then on the least played, I thought it was going to be PB Hood actually because... What? Like, she has to hit your opponent, and people really like blocking right now. Like, Aphidiophobia is all over the place. Mm -hmm. Leaf Shield's all over the place. Templar's all over the place. Skull Bear is all over the place. And, like, she just doesn't... She just kind of runs headlong into all of these cards. Yeah. I guess I kind of, in the back of my mind, forgot about her. I like her cards, but I keep on forgetting <laughs> what her character does. That's, that's a good point, because also, <laughs> basically, her with her stuff, Gemini Man's just better. Because well, he, he turns on the plus one damage, better. and he gets the plus two speed as well. But he doesn't draw any cards. Oh, well. Drawing cards is sweet. Drawing he's cards is sweet if it hits. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's there's a world where Gemini, where uh, BB Hood's like a mile better than Gemini Man. Like, imagine playing against Gutsman or uh, Goro or someone, and like BB Hood just like slaps them for seven every turn, and they keeps drawing cards and stays way ahead of them. Gemini Man's like, oh, I have all this speed. It uh, doesn't do anything. So, I think the definitely when the when the set drops, I think that uh, Lord Raptor is actually going to be one of the most played characters. Raptor is exciting. Well, he's he's got a gimmick that we've never done before, and getting all sorts of free shit happening when you review cards, which is something people have done since the beginning. I think people are going to be really excited about it, but I think. As the time goes on, people are going to start playing Dimitri more, and I think uh, Shinko is going to see some play. Yeah, I think people are going to want to try her gimmick out as well. I'm surprised you didn't rate Shinko as the least played out of spite. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I agree that BB Hood might be the least played, not even because she's bad. Not at all. No. No, I I think that um, she her, her avenue to victory just doesn't seem as obvious. When you got uh, hit with these little derp derp moves and hope to draw cards, hope your opponent doesn't block, and then keep your happy ass alive as well. Yeah. Just just play Robot Masters. Think... Yeah, obviously. Good obviously. So the next question we have is from uh, Jesse Cervini asking us, after the release of Darkstalkers and the new Champion promos, who are the top five characters in the game? Let's start with Kevin. I hate this question. <laughs> I, I like 
we just saw Gareth Brackett second place with Tim Keefe, who was the running joke of the community for so long. But anyway, I have my top five. So I have, uh, I read, I had, and not really, like, this isn't, like, number one and number two. I don't think there's a big gap between these. But I had Skullman, Gemini Man, Athena, Jiffany Jamber, and Gareth Brad. Interesting. And what about you, Hughes? We got some pretty similar choices. This is also no particular order. I just, these were the things that popped into my mind. Uh, Garrett, Gemini Man, Jiffany Jamber, uh, Skull Man, and Snake Man. And for the record, I forgot about Jiffany Jamber until we were talking about it pre- before the show, and I'm like, oh yeah, she's way better than Paul Bittner. Yeah, my top five is going to be uh, Skull Man, Gemini Man, Dimitri, Garrett Brat, and Jiffany Jamber. Um, I think Garrett is going to continue to be very good for the four weeks he's left legal in the format. Yeah, he's just kind of quietly, I don't know, yeah. good. I definitely and think he obviously. Yeah, I was gonna say he obviously has a lot of range where you can kind of exploit him more, or like he gives you a lot of tools you can work with, and you, it's up to you to use them perfectly. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think he does. He has a lot of powerful synergies with stuff. Yeah. Kevin, would you say yeah. that Garrett's probably the hardest of the five of them to play? By far, because he's he's definitely complicated. Um, I would say that would be the reason why we didn't actually see him in anything for so long until you started I going mean, around with them and one or two other people started going around with them. Well, like, I know I played against Ben Shoemaker, who's an excellent player. I mean, he, he literally just won U.S. Nationals mm-hmm. in the first round of the Atlanta Pro Tour. And, like, we were both still kind of feeling out our decks. But having played Garrett, I think that he was making, like, he, he like, I kind of disagree with some of the mindset he had where like I would play a, I would play a foundation and he wouldn't immediately respond. He would wait until he would see what I was doing. And just the possibility that I could say, Oh, well you're not responding. I'm just going to pass my turn now. Like there's a lot of, and he, like he was just like, and then he would miss responses. He wouldn't respond. He wouldn't use Garrett's ability on his own turn very often. And I think there's a lot of, a, a lot of space to fought, like to play the deck more perfectly that you really have to do before you can really get anywhere because when he wins, it's like he, he it's it's like a really tactical way to win. Because he doesn't add damage. He doesn't really have a lot of times he'll be speed bumping and and then hoping they block so they tap out so then you can speed him up later and have it actually matter. Like it's it's tricky. Speaking of uh Jiffany Jamber, I'm just gonna add a little fun thing in here. Last week in Rochester we had our Jiffany Jamboree, where everybody played Jiffany Jamber except for Ryan Field because he's a punk. And, and giggles because he's also a punk, but he, he played <laughs> no, he played he, him he, he played her him. often enough. Yeah, he like he he swept into Felicia all the time, but who cares? So uh, I thought it was an interesting time. I know Kevin and I both played uh, Jiffany off of all, and drew eight million billion zillion cards. <sighs> Ryan Field is the biggest punk. He went two zero. He had a, like res- halfway respectable deck, I guess, and then he scooped on turn three to me. He's like, I'm sick of this garbage. I'm just like, I only have 11 foundations in play. What are you, what's, what's wrong? <laughs> He's like, I don't want to deal with this. Uh, Hughes actually had a pretty deadly Jiffany Jamber deck, I thought. Uh, Jiffany Jamber is really, really good at finding Rain Flush every turn. Sometimes twice per turn. Oh, yeah. I mean, you don't want to. lucky, just, like, three. Dr- you don't want to just, like, flush it out. Like, you don't want to just, like, be a drizzle flush. You want to you have, like, a thunderstorm Make flush. It rain. Like, that's what you really want. <laughs> yeah. She's also. You got to get all the rains. Because she's an eight hand size, she's the best at finding, setting up, and not clogging your hand with uh, Leaf Shield fulfilled in battle combo. So, you love that combo, so it's a good combo. I like it. I, I mean, well, similar to what you were saying, Hughes, I found that to be really nice when I was playing the Jiffany Jamboree because I ran a shitload of actions in my all deck. Oh yeah, I was running a set of both throw it down and Templar and wasn't even completely embarrassed about it because even though you sat on a Templar for a couple of turns, you still got seven fresh cards minimum. Yeah. My- <laughs> yeah. Like I remember, I remember way back playing Phil Birch at us nationals this year. And like you would review attacks all the time and still have way too many attacks and actions in your hand all the time. Like if you just wanted to build, it was, it was hard to get like, it, like it was inconsistent to get four cards in play, but it's Jiffany Jamber. Your hand can be two attacks and a Templar, and you're like, eh, I'll see how this goes, and you'll still almost certainly have three foundations to play that turn if you want to. 
And she's a wombo combo if you've got a 12th Pharaoh and making a killing in play. Yeah. And then it's <laughs> like, yeah, I'll build five after holding these three cards in my hand. Ha ha. <laughs> Attack yeah. this. I definitely, like, my average hand uh, during that tournament would be, like, a Revoke, a Leaf Shield, a Rolling Cutter, and a Rain Flush. And then I'd be like, build four, have these in my hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just look at those cards, look at my opponent, and just go, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just, I never had a point where I was satisfied enough, because I previously, right before a turn, was thinking about trying to build a deck that ran track zero, so I could flush people's hands after playing four foundations, but it just didn't come together quickly enough for me. That's, that's uh, probably going into my deck as a one of. All said and done with Jiffany Jammer, I really, there was a lot of attacking and a lot of blocking in that tournament. Yeah, and games went longer than you'd expect. But enough with that. We're gonna move on to a bonus question I received from Facebook from, uh, from Big Daddy Piglet. Uh, he wants to know, in our opinions, what symbols won with the release of Darkstalkers? What symbols got a push? And Ooh. I'm gonna add a second part to his question: What symbols didn't do so well? Air definitely got a bunch of toys. Because mm -hmm. Malicia's stuff is really good, and Raptor's stuff is insane. And they share symbols with that on air, so. It's a really hard question. It, it is yeah. a difficult question. I'm going to jump in and say, I think Death got a lot of cool toys. Uh, because Lord Raptor's gimmick's pretty cool. I mean, reviewing a foundation and getting a freebie is not bad. Who's the other Death character uh, again? Jada. Jada. I like a lot of Jada's attacks. I don't know if I think it's good or not, but I like them. I like Spragio. Spragio. Yeah. I've been watching... Have you, have you guys seen the Tetris God video? Yes. Of course I have. Squiggly. Uh, uh, yeah, Squiggly. Oh, um, it's a great video, by the way. It's college humor. Go watch it. I yeah. think All also did pretty good. All certainly didn't do bad. Uh, it's got got a couple good attacks from J. Talbain. Um, I think. Oh Jesus, right! I forgot about Dragon Cannon. We uh, we should talk about Dragon Cannon. That card is really good. Cannon. And I think th I like the actions that came out in Bishamon support, which not actions, uh, weapons rather. And I think the weapons are going to be really good for people who are trying to play Astrid still in extended. Oh jeez, I didn't even think of that. Did Did you? Did you watch when I was on Total Justice Gaming and we just like went through BB Hood and every card was extended Astrid? <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember that. It was, it was a great time. It was a great time. So, Kevin, what symbols do you think made out the best? Why are you doing this to me? I don't know. All of them. None of them. It's so hard. <laughs> like, uh, one, one I, I'm going think... to say all because Dragon Cannon's stupid. I and think Earth is really good so at Dragon well. It got a couple new throws. But I, I feel yeah, like I, agree. I feel like like Shinko is really hard with the way I think a lot of people play. Does Shinko even have Earth? Yes, yeah. she does. Yeah, I think a lot of her cards just don't play well with the way people build Earth right now. Yeah. the The problem is like I see Chaos Earth and good. While there are some really good cards, especially for Chaos, um, I feel they didn't do too well because. A lot of Hisenko's cards, except for maybe like two or three specific cards, work with Hisenko and Hisenko alone. So there's a lot of wasted cards for those symbols. And so I mm -hmm. feel the same thing with Death Good. Uh, hey, there's the sharing symbol. Uh, and Water, because a lot of Jada's stuff. Like there's a couple of choice cards, but a lot of it you want to play with Jada. So I would say Good right there, just from looking at those, probably got the biggest shaft out of everything. Yeah, uh, I think any symbols on Shinko didn't just didn't do as well as they could have. I feel like we, you know, the designers tr tried to put two very specific gimmicks on her. Yeah, that... she she is definitely. Uh, I feel like she is the the most complicated card that could be designed successfully. I, mean, <laughs> I, I will put this way: the, the, cl the cleverest ideas altogether. If people watched my set review yet that we did for Total Justice Gaming. She has two key foundations. Yeah, of course you wouldn't, Kevin. But she has <laughs> two key foundations for Chaos that I think are insanely good. So, I do give her that. She gave me two of my favorite cards in the set. 
fighting as one and hunters once more. And then she gave you 17 other cards that make no sense. Yeah. Hey, you know, she has a, she has an, a, like a, an attack that's hard to revoke. You have multiple I mean, on. If I'd you're, like if to you're hope, playing her. <laughs> I'd like to hope that design puts some more cards out in the future that touch on her themes. Because otherwise, I feel like she's going to end up very isolated. Committed momentum, especially, it feels like there's yeah. there, like you could you can do anything you want with committed momentum. It's just a, a thing you can put on cards. Yeah, the and I think that. Yeah, the Go ahead. Hi, sorry, like the Highlander thing, I don't like too much. Like it, it can be good. I'm I'm gonna work it's, on it after. It's Gen just Con. Tim making sweet love to your brain. <laughs> um, but I've always liked playing stuff that messes with momentum, or any like anything that. Uh, activates from the momentum, or just committing your momentum. Like, I played Young Sung years ago. Young Sung was one of my fav favorite characters, and he was a fan favorite within the card game. Because you could be like... I got so many foundations. Yep. I'll play Power Up. I have two foundations. Play a move. Oh, you, pl you win first. I'll play Hop. Get two momentum. Start wailing on you turn one. Get in there, boy. <laughs> like, let's just functionally reprint Young Sung. Just to sell yeah, he wouldn't even be he wouldn't even be overpowered without one arm maneuvers and whereabouts unknown and criminal yeah. uppercut and friends. See, my problem is whenever someone says let's reprint Young Sung, I think of the other one. Where <gasps> oh. I got to play a million billion fulfillion foundations always. Yeah, no. The first time I built a legacy deck after we were talking about legacy earlier a little bit. The first time I built a deck, um, it was, you know, a little bit after like Red Horizon two. It maybe Red Horizon one or two. It came out, and I'm like, yeah, let's let's start playing legacy, guys. I'm gonna build this deck. It's gonna be like 80 cards. It's a freaking monstrosity with four vast resources and like all these great, fun, miserable for my opponent cards. And they banned 40 of the cards. <laughs> 40 of the cards out of my list. Like, 12 independent cards. All gone. Uh oh. All right, let's move on to our next question. Comes from Sabino Cuomo. Uh, is stacking Proto Man worth it? I'd like to take the lead on this one and say, no. It is not. Pretty unlikely, yeah. Uh, I find that if you're going to be stacking Proto Man, I, the, you're going to want, you're really banking on getting both of their abilities. And having to play a six difficulty, effectively an asset, and only having four of them in the deck, it just seems really unlikely that it's going to happen in a time that it's going to be beneficial for you. And, and, well, I think the big thing is that if you're stacking Proto Men, you have to be playing a deck that doesn't mind playing a six difficulty form that doesn't help you pass control checks and just add like just adds gives you abilities and i think the only time you'd want to do that is if you're starting the seven hand size proto man and you're an extremely defensive deck and you want the two, the six hand size proto man's abilities to help you push damage through and he's really slow at doing that and i think that if you build that deck it's not going to work very well yeah the yes. st the stacking of characters has always been one of the things that i felt design wise was has always been a problem because if your character's not designed for stacking, like if they're not a stacker like Gemini Man or the Angels or Hoyt Sill or Jen, etc., uh, then it's really hard to get them stacked. And there's not much of a benefit. There's no instantaneous benefit uh, for how difficult it is. So if your character's not designed for it, I feel it's never worth it. Um, it's something I would like them to fix. Uh, somewhere down I the mean, line. Broadly speaking, I think I think stacking characters like the vision is that your character card is a powerful card in your deck. You want to build your deck around your character, mm -hmm. and then if you stack another six difficulty character, it's it's like the six difficulty is irrespective of how strong the cards are. Mm -hmm. Like characters are usually much stronger than foundations, um, because it's like a unique effect you only get you only, you get to start the game with. Like if you mm -hmm. can, if you could if you played like the old Dion Songs, you could stack the Dion Songs and have like infinite control checks, but you probably built your deck to just have infinite control checks in the first place mm -hmm. with whatever their gimmick was with whatever their particular gimmick was. Mm -hmm. And yeah. yeah, go ahead. I know from a design standpoint, you know, we characters are very powerful, like Kevin said. And I I feel like if you try to intentionally design two characters that are designed to be stacked that are both incredibly powerful 
that could be very scary for as far as power level. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have two Mega Man out right now, and I think both Mega Man character cards are completely respectable. And I think if people were really interested in trying to stack characters, and if it was really practical, I think that's the first one we'd see stack up first. I think I just changed ideas in the middle of my thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think Mega, uh, if Mega Man's were if the Mega Man Mega Men were better, I, I think I wouldn't be surprised to see people stacking them. They're both kind of a little bit defensively oriented and could use the, a bit more a bit more muscle to push through their kills. Um, and if there were tools to help that, like if there were Mishima Family Bloodline still, like the the old uh, Kazuya card that said after you play a character, draw two cards. And after you block with a character, if it if you can if it like if it can stack, it goes directly to your stage area to stack. I think we might see people playing that kind of deck. And I think yeah. the the thing stopping like these Mega Man Mega Man and Proto Man from being good stacker characters is just that, you know, neither of the characters are really, you know, like high tier characters you want to play in the first place. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so like the fact that you can't like that it's not a good idea to stack Proto Man is you can almost look at it like as like a safety valve that if we made a mistake with one of them that it wouldn't be oh suddenly we have six proto men fighting for diversity and everyone's miserable yeah i feel like that's another way to facilitate it like bloodline like uh i wish there was a way to change the rules but that's really really scary to do and sabino had a follow-up question uh why can't he build a good deck and i have the answer for this one uh, Sabino, you need to travel to more events. You never show up for the tournament. The more UFS you play, the better your decks are. Uh, if you look at you know areas of the country with playgroups that are performing very, very well right now, you'll notice that they play a lot of UFS. Calgary always performs very well. Uh, you've got the prodigy Garrett Brett and friends who play UFS pretty frequently. Uh, Las Vegas is a major up-and-comer, and they play UFS almost every night of the week. So I, I think th- there's no coincidence that the more UFS you play, the better you are, the more decks you play. Uh, people from Rochester are consistently sitting at the top tables at Nationals and Worlds, and that's because we get together with all of our friends across from New York six times a year to test in different meta games and try to beat the hell out of each other. I mean, Empire Circuits are not, not frequently very soft events. So that's my answer to that question. Uh, yeah, I, I agree in, in large part. Playing more is the best way to, to improve and to learn because you you have to put your ideas out there and put them through the, the crucible of getting beaten up by someone else. Um, and I think that it, it can also... Also, another approach might be to try to expose yourself to more ideas about how to construct a deck. We don't have a lot of... Uh, like some other games have a, have a really huge culture about you know writing about everything and exploring all these ideas, and we don't have I mean shows like this are like we're popping up and where we can talk about these ideas, but like go out and try to find all the coverage you can, look at all the decks, not just the ones that win, like look at the ones in eighth place and find something that's really cool in that deck, look at the decks that got to, like search, search people out who you thought had a cool idea but didn't make top cuts, and try to find more ideas to expose yourself to on, on ways you can you know, expand your repertoire for decks you can build and cards you can play. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And as a community, we can post decks more often to give people more ideas, and I think it'll increase the caliber of the whole UFS community as a whole. Yeah. yeah. I know every time I travel to an event, I always get these really awesome ideas from the unique decks I see, uh, and it allows me to look at the game from a different way i never seen before. So just going and traveling and just looking at other people's decks can also just give you more ideas on how to think about the game. Well, I remember one time I was playing against a young lady from Poughkeepsie, and she was playing this uh, Iceman deck. And oh, Iceman is a thriller. Deck. And I didn't even know Iceman was even remotely playable until she like played 13 attacks in one turn. I had to block with all the Templars to not die. Yeah, he's not playable until you realize that if you go, like, not ham, but, like, 14 hams, like, you go as hard as physically possible and then harder, he's like, holy crap, I'm just dying on turn two to this insanity. What's going on? No, I can't stop that. Crazy things can happen. And those ideas might be, for, for players, a springboard into something that could take them to the top tables and win them lots of prizes or even win the ultimate prize. 
A hug from yeah, Sean actually, O'Brien? The greatest prize. <laughs> Um, to, to segue into one of our other questions, actually, to skip skip down one, uh, someone, Christina, asked, uh, what deck surprised me the most at the Atlanta Pro Tour? And my answer to that, like, I wrote this down, was that the two decks that surprised me the most were the Psyche deck that Devin Bernier from Calgary lent me that I played in singles, and then the Chaos Skullman that, got, that went 5-1 at the Pro Tour, and that I got a chance to play with the next day in uh, friendly games. Shane just lent it to me to, to play some casuals with one of the guys down there. And I thought they were both exploring these ideas that I'd never had before. And were both really interesting decks that took that came at things from a different angle. And I really appreciate those uh, Shane and Devin for letting me borrow those decks and experience that, those things. Because like, I never would have thought of playing freaking... Uh, Psyche. Well, not just Psyche, but... Uh, What's the the team asset? Team Yagami, yeah. And then putting it with four Nevoses in my deck and my character that doesn't have a speed pump. Like, oh, that makes perfect sense once you say it out loud because, well, Nevoses' biggest problem is it doesn't have speed. And giving your attack stun too, that adds a bunch of damage, taps them out, and maybe you tap out their last enhances, so now it's plus four speed. Uh, and then the Chaos Skullman deck was was just, like, so much card draw. It, it could draw, like, once you started going off, you could draw your deck. And I didn't realize Skullman could do that, which, I mean, if someone, like, if you, if you sent down the cards in front of me and said, hey, here's the deck you're playing, I'd be like, oh, this, can this draw its deck after turn three? Sure. But I hadn't realized that in the, the forefront of my mind yet. And so I had the chance to go down to Atlanta and pick up these other people's decks, and they gave me great ideas. Mm-hmm. And, and they surprised th- me the most. The meta is going to be very, very, very exciting here over the next couple of weeks. Because Darkstalkers becomes officially street legal this Friday. Immediately after that is a pro tour on yep. Saturday in Rochester. And then three weeks later is Gen Con. So two and weeks two weeks with and that's that's a different meta. That's got five more cards in it. Seven. Seven. Right? It's, got, it's got five champ cards plus the July promos. And then following Gen Con six weeks later, no, four weeks later, is St. Louis with a completely new meta once again with all the champ cards rotated out. Yeah, but the old champ cards gone, and then the, also the new, the, the second cycle of new promos, including Roy, now legal. He Roy's my boy. Your boy. And you then... Evil Steve Fox? See, I, I want to play him in Extended. Stack, Stack. Yeah. yeah! And draw 14 cards. Because none of your opponent's stuff readies ever. So, I, meta's going to be changing quite a bit each of the next three events. So, yep. it's, I think it's going to be really hard to keep up. That's why you got to, you know, watch those lists going up. No look at the deck lists that get posted after Rochester, the ones after Gen Con. Because St. Louis is going to be fun. And really, I mean, you, like, if you're looking at decks, you're going to be a step behind. You've got to go out there and start testing your ideas against people and start playing the game. That's the best way to learn. That's the best way to, to explore something is to, to, to pick an idea, run with it as far as it'll go, and then see, see where it takes you. All right. Our next question is from Justin Clark, uh, the amazing artist who did Millennium Games and Hobbies. Uh, he asks, what are Lord Raptors and Dimitri's best symbols? And that, that's another question that Kevin probably doesn't like. Uh, I don't hate it. I mean, I think my, my guess on these would be uh, Lord Raptor off air and Dimitri off of life. Uh, I think like life is the uh, life is the symbol that's just full of so many con- like just screw you over meta cards mm-hmm. that I think could be really good with Dimitri, where you just pick apart your opponent's game plan. And I, I'm not sure how you went off that. I'm not, I'm not sure really how his, what his best way to kill people is. I was just about to having, ask that. <laughs> well, having Dark Side Master available can certainly fix up some problems, some ga- some gaps in that. That mm-hmm. issue, and uh, Lord Raptor, I think off of air, I really like his synergy with Templar, where you can build, like you can you can build an aggressive staging area and then use Templar if they attack you, you block, you draw two, and now you have cards to review step. Where and then uh, if they don't attack you, you just review Templar, and now you're ready to attack them back, or now you're ready to push their push their stuff in. And I think that air has a lot of, uh, it's got a lot of toys to stay alive and stuff. And then Lord Raptor gives it uh, ultimate undead, especially kind of gives him a, spe- a very, very unique way to just kind of kill you, dump, dump his hand on the table, and yeah, put you, put you on the ground. 
Yeah, I, I, I'm really excited to build Lord Raptor off of death after the Pro Tour is over. Um, I want to see what kind of things I can do. I kind of want to run, like, uh, want to run some of Robert's support in him. Oh, baby. Yeah. What about, I want to run... Hmm? What about what off of Void? So you play Ultimate Undead, start cycling some cards to make your brain flushes huge. Oh, yeah. Fair enough. I, I think guys... Lord Raptor has three perfectly playable symbols. Yeah. So what do you guys think about Dimitri, though? Uh... I agree with life. Uh, I was going to ask you, and you unfortunately said you don't know, on what's the best way with win with them, because I've been trying to figure that out for a couple of weeks now. I mean, you can probably just play all of his own stuff and just, like, your, your win condition is to chip them with throws forever and dark side master them if they start snoozing. Yeah, I guess double dark side master into a bunch of throws wouldn't be the worst plan. Yeah, I'm thinking life for Dimitri as well. I mean, all, all the life decks I've built you know, in a while now have all been seven hand sizes that are, you know, trying to be kind of like spammy pokey decks because, you know, life hasn't well, it doesn't have a lot of... It's not competitive on the speed pump front with symbol, like with characters like Lilith or Gemini Man, and it's not competitive on card advantage the way that Skull Man or... Well, you, tr you try to be competitive on card advantage by being a seven-hand size and playing attacks like Ring Boomerang and draw cards. Alrighty, so our next question, our final question for the show tonight... Um, is from Christine O'Brien asking about what we predict is going to happen this weekend in Rochester. Well, I'm going to win with Gemini Man. Get I'm out of here. Gemini Man. Get out of here. And I'm going to go to the bathroom right now. Drop mic. Peace. Well, um, now that well, he's that's gone. interesting. Uh, so, I think I, I'm not expecting any surprises at Rochester. To be honest with you guys, with a. Uh, a uh, set that's only been out for a day. I'm expecting uh, Skull Man to perform well again. I'm expecting Gemini Man to perform well again. Um, I'm expecting to sell lots of singles the morning of the event. Um, I mean, if, if Kevin's going to be running Gemini Man, he might be the man to beat. Um, he really likes winning those plane tickets. I think that he's going to get out diversified by his brother playing Gemini Man. Because his, <laughs> his brother's been playing Gemini Man a lot more and a lot longer, and he's got a really solid deck, and he knows how to play it really well. I think... would love it if Ben just took the entire event. What are you going to run, Hughes? <laughs> Fuck if I know. Oh, we're, that's, we're live. I, I No clue. That was a swear. Yep. If I was to play, and I'm not able to because I'm judging... I would probably be playing Lord Raptor. Because he's so cool. Uh, Kevin Broberg, are you back? No. Why would I be back? So he like thinks you're going to get diversified this Saturday by Ben Broberg. Interesting. He's going to play Water so, Gemini Man, and he's going to out-diversify you. I, I would be surprised if we can't come to an understanding, given that we live together and are brothers. I am going to force him to play that Gemini Man deck. If he's, How will you do that? I'll put it this way. If he's not, I am. Okay. I mean, there have been many, I, I many see. brothers over the years, Kevin, who have gone to war with each other. Um, Cain and Abel, they're brothers who killed one another. Um, oh, boy, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Bert and Ernie. I mean, Bert they never got along. <laughs> Cain and the Undertaker? So I'm ready for the Broberg Smackdown Saturday night. I suppose it's actually kind of appropriate that we'd be playing Gemini Man, I guess. Because <laughs> you're brothers? Yeah. <laughs> no, no way. Okay. Uh, fortunately, we had one more topic for tonight, and that was the sideboard discussion, but 10 minutes is not enough time to do that. We are never yeah, we've sideboarded the sideboard discussion for the, like, the third consecutive week. <laughs> just gonna just like slide that one out. Yeah, we don't need these. Well, let's put that as top billing for next week. A um, few announcements before we call it a night here. Uh, this weekend is the Rochester PTC at the Brighton Community Center. Uh, for those of you coming to the event, we're very excited. 
Uh, please use the entrance on Winton Road. Otherwise, you'll have to walk all the way around the community center to get to the event. Um, we have lots of fun. It's the entrance right that you would get you would get to coming right off the highway. So uh, we're gonna have a lot of fun uh, Friday night. We're gonna be having a Darkstalkers release event draft uh, at Millennium Games and Hobbies on West Henrietta Road. Uh, following that, we're gonna go to some manner of quicker dinner than normal. So we're probably gonna get calzones or something like that. Okay. Uh, cool. Saturday is the event. Uh, Signups do begin at nine thirty. Uh, with the players meeting at 10.15, and we start playing at 10.30. Uh, I will put a break in after the third round for people to go get foods, and there are plenty of restaurants nearby. I'd like to finish the event that night, go out to the best barbecue place this side of the Mississippi, and that's Sticky Lips Barbecue. Yum, yum, yum. For the, Saturday the best garbage summer. plates, second best garbage plates in town, and we like our garbage plates, so they're very good. Uh, Sunday, we'll be getting breakfast at the American Burger Bar and Beer Boutique, which has beer and garbage plates at 1130 in the morning. And also, also a, I mean, appropriate to their name, an incredible selection of burgers. And then, depending on time, we'll be also having the Empire Circuit Final, either Saturday night or Sunday during the day, where the top six people in points will be drafting uh, Darkstalkers. To see who's going to win the plane ticket. Where are we having so there'll be that? two plane tickets. Um, I'm working on that. Somewhere. Are we just going to have it like behind me here? We could. I have two tables. Have Denny's. We could record it that way. Yeah. Um, so two plane tickets give, given out at Rochester this weekend. So I'm pretty excited. Following the Rochester PTC. On July 29th through August 2nd is Gen Con. The biggest four days in gaming. Greatest. Greatest. Well, it's also the biggest. Not At the Indianapolis Convention Center in Indianapolis, Indiana. We hope to see as many of you there who can make it. Uh, remember, Jasco Games is still looking for volunteers at their booth in the vendor hall. So if you want to come and hang out with all of us after hours, which is a, an incredible time, you can still do it. You just need to get your ass there. Uh, we're going to be posting the uh, Rochester schedule here pretty soon of where we're going to be each night. Uh, we know that Wednesday night we will be at Kilroy's, enjoying the $8, 32-ounce Long Islands. And a fun time will be had by all. They have a really nice patio, after Gen Con is the St. Louis PTC on August 29th at the Dizzy Dugout in Collinsville, Illinois. So that's going to be the thir another meta. Old Champ card's gone. Um, could be a, I think that's going to be a great event. And, you know, if you haven't pre-registered, pre-register for that as soon as possible so you save five bucks. And then here in September is the Michigan PTC at Eternal Games in Warren, Michigan. Uh, they always throw a good time for everybody with Friday night Buka and Whirly Ball, followed by the main event on Saturday. You should toss me in your car for that. Isn't the rest of your crew going? I don't know. I don't know what our plan is. I know that I'm not going to have much money for it. Because I'm going to be saving up for more nationals. Well, people should uh, buy from us. So, remember, on that note, uh, Rochester CCG, in addition to retail, also does wholesaling. If your store does not carry enough UFS, have them get a hold of Matt Hughes, mhughes at rochesterccg.com, to get more UFS into your store. Our prices are better than most other distributors, and our customer service is way better. So, give us a shot. Point upwards, and you'll be pointing at it. At our emails. Ah, there really? you go. It's up on the stream. Woohoo! So that way people can actually read. I did not even know that. Any other announcements, final thoughts before we call the night, gentlemen? Other than the Saturday Night Smackdown of the Broberg Brothers. We'll wait to see if that's the featured match. I, I will welcome you if you wish to play Water Gemini Man Hughes. Uh, we call that easy money. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, have a good night.